just wanted to say welcome to everybody to the uh, public talk organized by the Association of Journalists in Slovenia. And in fact, this is done within the broader uh, framework of a European campaign uh, or European initiative for media pluralism. And we will now watch the film, the animation, promoting the European wide action. Please. Unchecked media concentration over several decades has allowed an increasingly small number of powerful media owners to accumulate vast amounts of revenue and influence. This has placed great political power in a few hands, giving them control over public debate, including which issues are addressed and which information is available to the public. In place of a range of viewpoints reflecting a diverse public, reporting is frequently dominated by the politicized positions private interest. The media is often used as a platform for attack and misrepresentation, as prominent voices objectify women, deny climate change, vilify immigrants <coughs> and the unemployed, and support government austerity. The Levson inquiry laid bare the cozy relationships between politicians, media owners, and editors. The culture of mutual interest between politicians and those in control of the media distorts a democracy in two ways. Firstly, by giving media proprietors lobbying power to influence government policy. And secondly, by favoritism granted to politicians by their close friends in the media, obstructing genuine attempts to inform the public. Meanwhile, a climate of insecurity has been created for journalists working to hold those in power to account. Journalists and editors involved in the publication of leaked evidence of mass surveillance the UK and US governments have been threatened with criminal prosecution <coughs> for reporting on these issues of vital public interest. We need a free and open press capable of informing citizens about issues of public interest. We need a diverse media to ensure free and fair debate and representation. It's time to reclaim the media for the many, not the few. We call for an EU directive that would implement the following legislation to avoid concentration of media ownership in advertising and the media, guaranteed independence of supervisory bodies for political power and influence, preventing the abuse of media power for special interests, rules enforcing transparency to identify beneficial owners of media outlets, reclaiming your media industry from unaccountable private power, sign the petition for a more open and diverse media industry. So this is, this is in fact a UK yeah. video within the broader European initiative. And uh, uh, welcome again. Exactly uh, the video was shown because uh, our guest is coming from the United Kingdom. And uh, Des Friedman is I I at the same time a chair of the uh, campaign <coughs> within the European framework promoting or requesting from the European Union, European institution to adopt legislation uh, on media pluralism. Des Friedman, welcome. Thank you. You are professor of media and communication at the Goldsmiths and at the same time activist in various uh, British NGOs, groups and so on. Our another speaker is Helena Milinkovic who is professional journalist at Public Service Broadcasting at Slovenia, but also both of you having your uh, profession as an uh, academic profes professor and Helena as a journalist, you both are engaged in various kind of civil society activism, defending rights of journalism and citizen, journalists and citizens in, in the media field. So uh, do we need uh, uh, Spella to explain more? I would like to say more what is this about. Huh? Yeah. Because this European initiative for media pluralism is something that was launched, uh, in fact, even two years ago. But in last almost year, it is a, a new wave of uh, attempt to collect million signatures by European Union citizens which is by new legislation in the EU, a kind of petition that is uh, binding <coughs> for the uh, European institutions 
requesting from them that they really have to act on the request of citizens in certain policy areas. areas. And then it is, it is necessary by this European legislation that at least six, seven countries are involved in this collection of citizen signatures in, in the petition. And in this case, in the case of collecting signatures uh, 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 of citizens in the European Union in this uh, uh, topic, Italy, Belgium, Bulgaria, France, Hungary, Germany, UK, and Cyprus are those seven that started the initiative. Slovenia and some others joined it later, uh, uh, but uh, the collection of uh, signatures will last until mid-August, I think, and this, this discussion is one of many events around Europe uh, uh, that try to mobilize citizens and public awareness around these issues. So at least if somebody in, in this room have, has not yet signed a petition, it's also available online. Uh, if you just search for European Initiative for Media Pluralism, you will find it even, and also in Slovenian language. But this issue in, in, of media pluralism and European Union, if we talk about uh, super na national structure of intergovernmental uh, framework is not new in fact. It's around for the two decades at least various uh, groups, uh, mainly journalists and citizens groups try to uh, influence European Parliament to act in that way and even European Parliament did some steps but always it was, it was blocked by the Commission in, in, in that. What, what uh, does make you to uh, uh, trust in this initiative? What you make part of it? It's the issue. The issue is one that we can't avoid. And a million signatures sounds like a lot of signatures. It sounds like an unachievable task. And it probably will be an unachievable task. But I know that there are millions of citizens across Europe who are worried and frustrated and angry about the state of the media in their particular country. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't have got involved. But you know that across Europe there are real problems, and there are different problems. The problems that you face in Hungary are slightly different to the ones that we, we face in Britain. Obviously, because we have very different media systems, the state has a very different role. But in no country, as far as I can see, are citizens adequately served by a genuinely pluralistic media. And by that I don't mean, I mean, pluralism is a wishy-washy word. Is that how good is everyone's English? Does wishy-washy make any sense? It's a, it's a phrase that can mean anything. And, the, and in fact, it's been used, a pluralistic media means you just have choice. So in Britain, we have, I've lost track, we have 600 cable stations, so we have choice. So where's the problem? Well, the problem is that most of them do not serve citizens' interest. Most of them, where they are news-based, are fairly narrow in their reporting, and especially the, main, the, 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 the most popular ones. So a real pluralism means taking different positions. It means really, it means looking like the populations. It means rich and poor. It means reflecting religious differences, all the cultural differences, minority perspectives. And I, I think, and, and being truly independent to be able to do that. So if someone can point out a state in Europe which has that kind of medium, we should move there. But I don't think that there is such a state. And that's why this kind of initiative should be one of many kinds of campaigns that are highlighting the importance of, uh, of, of, the, of the need for a media that looks like us, talks like us, and has the full range of arguments. And we're a long way from that. But, Helena, for you as a, as a journalist, do you uh, have a ca kind of trust into European-wide initiative? You have s specific problems which are not so specific as a, as a journalist in Slovenia. And, and how it looks to you like initiative that will that tr try to request something from the European Parliament Commission to defend you and your rights. How do you see that? Well, 
as you labeled me before, yeah, as a critic, while I'm very critical and skeptical, probably even if we get these millions of uh, signs and the parliament confirms the initiative, the commission will block it. We've seen what happened with the directive about the water when the first time the citizen's initiative was used and then, of course, the European Commission said, okay, we will not go with the directive about privatization of the water, but now they changed the stance and they say, okay, each an individual country has its own right to do with, with its resources as it has. And the other thing why I'm so skeptical is, what did we hear from Commission, from Brussels, from the Parliament, when the Greek government shut down the Greek public broadcaster? Of course, they were appalled, they were, oh yeah, worried, but nothing happened. EBU supported the uh, Greek public TV. Uh, with just giving them the satellite link so they could go with the program. And still, you had this group of journalists, media workers from the public service who occupied the building and they financed it with their own money. Mm -hmm. They still do it. They started to commission some funds from the public. I think it's the point where we all have to rethink what are we telling the public. Of course they are critical because every day they see mostly politicians on TV and we don't give them the background how to, to understand why and what is happening. I think let's keep still for a while with this European Union and, and uh, the governments and, and, and this, this context and then we will go to the media themselves. But. Um, it was, it was often mentioned that the European Union, why it is not active, uh, for, well, has not been active in this field for 20 years, because in fact governments uh, and, uh, uh, and the Commission uh, even more serve la rather industry interest than citizens' mm -hmm. interest. And this, this exactly uh, action is like citizen initiative, and that is now uh, 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 why I am insisting on that, can we still believe that, that this time they will serve citizens' interests in Europe and not uh, industry interests in, in Europe and big industries in UK, German media industry and so, what, so on? I don't think so, because we are now in the austerity so time and still the Brussels Parliament and the com new commission, we don't know how it will look like, they will still go with the austerity. And this is what is killing the media, actually. You said that the Commission haven't been active for 20 years. But the thing is, they have been active. They've been active in <laughs> yeah. doing absolutely nothing to change the rise of privatization, um, concentration, to make sure that whatever monopoly controls are there are so weak and very rarely applied. That, to me, is being very busy. Mm -hmm. It's just being busy to keep things down. Now, I completely agree with you about um, scepticism. I mean, I think in this case, it's a, it's a realism. The record of Brussels in this area is terrible. Mm -hmm. But it just depends how you see reform campaigns. You can either see, and, and the initiative is a pretty classic reform campaign, you either see it as a handful of people who, are, who have good intentions pleading with very powerful people to say, will you help us because we're not happy? I mean, you won't get anywhere. Or you see this as the means to, across Europe, to start to try at the grassroots and galvanise people using the petition as a mechanism, but with very realistic expectations that even if we got five million signatures, it would be a fight with Brussels. I mean, Brussels' instincts are so bad about this that when we had the, the news reports very recently about um, B Sky B, the British, very big, the, the biggest broadcaster in Britain, much bigger than the BBC, um, um, planning to buy up Sky Italia and Germany to create a huge, powerful pan-European pay TV broadcaster, you would have thought that anyone in the competition directorate in Brussels may have woken up and made some phone calls, but we had nothing, absolutely nothing. I'm sure they discussed it with the people from B Sky B. So 
I, I think you're right. We should have no illusions that these reforms will be delivered, even with a million signatures. But I do think there is a real importance of citizens' groups, of NGOs, of academics, of students, and I hope of journalists and journalist organisations starting to act together, because we will, with or without Brussels, this will need to be a campaign that, that, that continues. Absolutely. Because we don't have enough information, actually, what is happening with the media. I mean, in real terms. Of course, you read something, uh, even... Well, usually editorial policies are that it's most ungrateful to report about yourself. That's why we don't report about what is happening with the public radio and TV, on public radio and TV. Uh, other media tackle this. And yeah, this is one of the very positive things I also think, uh, that we connect to create some network, yeah. a platform. Of course, it will take time to change stuff, yeah? Maybe infiltrate your own people. Um, I don't know. You, there's, you were um, doing the research on how media policy is done in UK and US, you know? Mm -hmm. And from our experience in Slovenia, we are highly regulated in the media field, and the laws are so in inefficient, and everybody involved in the development of the laws is so dissatisfied uh, that we are still, uh, how to say, uh, have a question whether the regulation that can really uh, intervene and protect citizens in the media field can be developed and work. What, is, what, is your, what are your findings in, uh, from your research? Why in, uh, the policy that doesn't work in, in terms of serving citizens? Well, it's, I would never make any judgments about what happens you know, in Slovenia or, or actually the 99.9% .9 of the world um, that I haven't studied. So I'm... I'm just going for the US and the UK as two important case studies, but they to are which, just two countries. To which we often to, to, which, to which wrongly, but understandably, too much of the world looks to. Mm -hmm. So they are significant. And I mean, the simple story is, on the one hand, a corporate capture, which I don't know the extent to which that's the case in, in Slovenia, but all the time you find very overt forms of, of regulatory capture, you see just these revolving doors, particularly in the US, blatantly and brazenly of people moving from regulators into the private sector, some of them who have just helped to frame particular regulations which help the company to which they're just about to join. It's, it's scandalous, it's classic corruption um, that maybe you do have in Slovenia, from what I hear. So, so there's, there's that element, but there's also just the question of the state and regulation. Because sometimes you, you can't just apply debates on regulation from one state to another. We are calling, in many of the debates um, over the press regulation, we're saying we need regulation. And people say, we don't want the state involved in this. This is the last thing we need. Because some states are already way too powerful. The kind of regulation that I am arguing for that has been long prevented is regulation that is independent of both the market and the state. Regulation is there to check the power of those two. But you have to therefore have accountability. You have to have some kind of democratic input. And all too often, we have failed to provide that oversight. So we have regulation in Britain, which is very well-meaning. There are elements of it which are progressive. There are policies and regulations in the sphere of community radio, which is pretty decent, which actually probably helps pluralism, even though it's so underfunded, it's not true. But the main regulatory debates are absolutely sealed up between a handful of players in the industry and in government, in the, in the civil service. And that's the same in the US. And I suspect it will be the same in many countries around the world. And unless there is no simple way out of it, unless the public, unless citizens, through their actions, challenge those relationships. And it's not the relationships that we wake up in the morning thinking we have to break this. We wake up in the morning thinking we have to get to work or our liberties are being eroded. We don't think media when we wake up. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the big issues that we have to confront. Do you, Helena, consider Slovenian media regulation, those uh, regulating your, your media public service broadcaster, or your status as a journalist having 
certain rights. I, do you feel it's useful? Um, do you ever refer to it in your fights, or, or it's in fact destroying your rights and status? Yeah, you of course you refer to that, but um, not successfully. Uh, of course, the media space in Slovenia, as I see it, is also captured uh, or hijacked by the politics yeah. or by the capital. So the private media have been hijacked by the capital, uh, like um, we have the brewery running the biggest broadsheet in Slovenia, and they run it as a brewery, not as a newspaper, <laughs> you know? Uh, and when you have people uh, who are responsible for a media and they say the articles don't sell, the ads sell. So what can you do? So, of course, journalists are, journalists are by that forced to survive like anybody else in the world or in the society. Um, we have the journalist associations, the syndicates, but then again, we have this big problem of solidarity. I'm a freelancer, I'm not full-time employed, so my position is different mm. um, in terms of, of, of course, pay, the working conditions, etc. cetera. Um, okay, but of course, because I work in a foreign news department, department, I'm more free about the content reporting than if I would report about domestic mm. or Slovenian foreign policy. Mm. I know because I'm talking from experience and I stopped doing that, yeah? Do we have any question from the audience? Some of you have been experiencing this European policy, our media policy and regulation. Do you have any comment or, or question about that? Not yet. Oh. Yes, please. Then. Yes. Thanks. Uh, I'm Tanya Kershev and I'm coming from the Slovenian Regulatory Authority. Uh, it is a convert authority like Ofcom, the British Ofcom, uh, and it covers a broad field of um, uh, different political uh, issues. Uh, first and the most important one is of course telecommunications sector and then media and uh, then postal services and also railway uh, infrastructure or access to the railway <laughs> infrastructure. So uh, we are quite uh, the agency for everything. Uh, and uh, this in a way affects also our performance, I, I have to admit. Uh, but um, I wanted to comment, I, I happen to, to be acquainted at, at least a little bit with the happenings in the international fora, in the e EU uh, policy making and so on. Uh, I think we are uh, too much maybe blaming the Commission uh, in this, uh, this non-activity or force activity. Uh, because the one of the main, uh, the, the, the main problems start with our governments actually. Because the Commission, uh, and I'm not defending it because I know <laughs> how it functions, but the Commission uh, in fact started a, a quite a number of initiatives also in terms of um, regulating uh, plural or, or tries to, to regulate pluralism, <coughs> but all failed mostly uh, because of the opposition of the governments of the most powerful countries which defended the interests of the media industry. Uh, already in, in the 90s, uh, Commission launched a, 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 a number of... Um, there, there was even a draft directive which never uh, came to light because it was uh, stopped al already at the, the beginning. And even now, uh, in the last revision of the AVMS directive, they started the, the public consultation also with questions whether to regulate media pluralism or, or not. And there wa was quite a consensus among the participating countries that this is not possible. Also for practical reasons, for the differences we have in the markets and so on. Uh, and Commission, of course, was quite happy and, uh, <laughs> and didn't uh, push this forward. 
but anyway, uh, also the, the case of independence of the regulatory authorities is very interesting. Uh, there was the commission, uh, the, the actor that most um, eagerly forced the initiative of having a provision of obligatory, uh, of having uh, the obligatory independent uh, regulators in each uh, member mm -hmm. state. Uh, but the, the uh, most important countries such as uh, Germany, Spain, uh, um, maybe even uh, Hungary, they stopped this and uh, didn't want to discuss it. Uh, I think that the UK was in favor, didn't, didn't oppose this, but uh, the opposition of the Germany was so strong that uh, it couldn't, uh, that any agreement couldn't be reachable and uh, the process ended with a compromise uh, really um, watered down a compromise that um, don't demand really uh, having a, a, an independent regulatory author authority in the, in, in the media field. But perhaps the issue of uh, independent regulatory authorities is interesting also uh, from, from, the, from some other perspective. Uh, Maybe the interest of the European Commission in this matter was also driven by their wish to gain some access to the uh, policy making uh, and regulation in each media uh, market. Because the problem uh, in the European Union is that they really uh, want to achieve the single market uh, in, uh, in the audiovisual, especially in the audiovisual media. And uh, each government then again uh, wants, wants to preserve uh, their, uh, their um, power in, in this field. And therefore we have a bunch of um, conflicting interests that are difficult to, to, um, to negotiate and to, to come to some useful conclusions. And uh, the problem uh, in, in many cases is that the civil initiatives are not really represented in this uh, policy making field. Uh, we, uh, if you look at the process of the last revision of the directive, you will see, and there is everything published on the uh, website of the European Commission, uh, you will see uh, who were the most important actors that contributed uh, both openly uh, to the debate and of course also on the, most, uh, on the more uh, not so transparent ways because all uh, these um, industrial players have their offices in, in the Brussels, and civil initiatives don't. And uh, there were really, really, uh, um, there was a really small number in comparison to the industrial actors particip of the civil uh, actors participating in the debate. So an initiative like this, uh, and uh, being heard, I think this is the only way but it will be difficult in any case. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Mr. Emil Lukancic. I apologize, but I don't good speak English. I can speak to Slovene, maybe a colleague, and to translate it. I'm my experience for last year for Europe Void. Vodem ne odvisno od iskona agencije od 23 let. Lansko leto je bil razpis strani Evropskega parlamenta da se prijavijo lahko mediji, ki bodo sodelovali pri promociji kampanije, predvolilna kampanja za Evropski parlament. Pripravili smo dokumentacijo, ki je obsegala 12 cm višine. Poslali smo jo na rok v Brusel, pač stroški kakšni koli so pač bili. Odgovor čez 14 dni smo dobili. Vš medij ni upisan v razvit medijev Evropskega parlamenta in zato ne morate sodelovati na javnem razpisu Evropskega parlamenta. Ko smo vprašali predstavništvo v Ljubljani, kaj mora storiti v bistvu 
Če se v eni državi registrira, 23 let delaš, pa da ti odgovorijo, iz birokracije, vse pa ni. Ne izpolnjujete pogojo. Je bil odgovor, ja, veste, je še en posebi dokument, ki se morate bi še mogli še posebi prijaviti. In to je njihov pogled na medijsko pokrajino, bom rekel, v državah, kjer so majhni, iz Brusla, iz Evropskega parlamenta. Zaprosili smo pa samo, bom rekel, za 8 tisoč evrov, da bi participirali pri našem, bom rekel, propagandi, da pomaga. So this is the case of small media and small countries having difficulties. Ne, mi nismo več mali, ja, veš. Ker jaz pravim, mi smo oni parfum. Najboljši parfum je vedno majhni stekleničke. In to smo mi v Sloveniji. I see another problem there, because European Parliament made its own media, you know? European Parliament, European Commission, they have media funds for what you are saying for propaganda about their policy, about their policies, of their policies. This is one of the big problems. Of course they don't recognize, they only want big media. Even it's not about a small country, but it's about the small media. I would say that. It's not discrimination on because you're Slovenian media. Well, a colleague of mine from public TV, she got the fund for the same thing. What I wanted to, uh, to uh, ask now is about this uh, ownership and industry players being in close relations with politicians. It's, it's not, the, the point we are now is quite, how to say, disturbing and obvious, but it, there is history, especially what I uh, learned from uh, some colleagues in the UK, when and how it became possible for British media owners to concentrate so strongly the power. There were some policy uh, moments in history, in your, uh, uh, your regulation, it, when the, uh, it was released, you know? And, and my question is, uh, there was obvious, uh, how to say, political will to, to do that. And how to, how to gain political will, especially after concentration is so huge, to, to stop it now, Who, which political players can break that, that kind of, how to say, incestuous relations between uh, 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 politicians, political groups, and media owners? Um, well, none of them, frankly, because they're all completely wrapped up in these relationships. Some of them may like being wrapped up in the relationships, and may, may feel, they may feel comfortable um, being wined and dined. Some of them may be more reluctant, but none of them, I think, have the political boldness to see a future beyond the influence of these very powerful um, corporations. So we had the most recent example, which for many of us in Britain is still quite staggering, is the leader of the Labour Party, um, Ed Miliband, which is the opposition party, which has a good chance of winning the next election, which has had a very stormy relationship with um, the major newspaper proprietors, and particularly with Rupert Murdoch over the last 25 years. It's had policies for many years that it should break up the Murdoch empire. Tony Blair, as I'm sure you know, um, is, is godfather to one of Rupert Murdoch's children. So that changed a bit. He is literally in the family. So there was that complicity at a personal level. Um, the new leader is much more uncomfortable with this. Yet, last week, he made the decision to um, be, for a photo to be taken of him holding the, new, the Sun newspaper, which is Murdoch and the most popular newspaper in Britain, um, because this was a, uh, uh, an addition that went out to every household in Britain at the start of the World Cup. And somehow, he thought it would be a good idea to hold a copy of The Sun, presumably because he doesn't dare say no. 
the backlash has been huge because people see him as weak. Because the first the reaction was that you don't you didn't want to do this, did you, Mr. Miliband? But you still did it. So he appears like a weak leader. Um, and that's just so symbolic of they may want to do this. And the most popular that Ed Miliband has ever been is when he made a speech saying, effectively, I'm going to bring down the Murdoch empire. And so lots of us were writing the Labour policies and handing them over. And we've had endless meetings about this. And yet, when it comes to the cold light of electoral um, misfortune, they don't, have, they don't dare. They don't have the guts. And these are the kind of relationships that have been built up over so many years. Um, a, f a fear of alienating very powerful press proprietors. And it's going to take someone very brave just to say, you know what, we can win an election without them. In fact, it may be popular to stand up to them. We have had media moguls from the Beaver Brooks, the Rothermere's, for, I don't know, near on 100 years now. And people have won elections without their support. Mm -hmm. And it needs that kind of confidence. But more and more, the system is built on this kind of complicity. So Labour politicians who don't like Mr Murdoch, there are more Labour politicians who go to the News International Summer Party, which is filled with champagne and everything else. More of them go than the Conservatives because they're so desperate to, 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 to be friends or to neutralise the attack. So it's a very hard question to answer, really, because it just it needs one person to have the political confidence to say that newspapers actually do not win elections by themselves. It's good policies. It's anti-austerity policies that might speak to the needs of ordinary people. That might actually be popular. In your media reform campaign, you have a, a quite a specific request in terms of how to uh, resolve the, this concentration issue in, in, in the UK. Mm. I remember some thresholds you are, you are requiring and so on. We have a number. Can you, can you just point a few just to get an idea? Well, the, the main one is that no company should have more than a 20% share of any news market. The, this is not a revolutionary demand. It is effectively saying that in any news market, by which we mean um, online, um, uh, uh, national and regional print, that there should be six, organized, six voices, let's use their, their language. If it's a maximum of 20%, effectively you're saying there should be six players. Now it could be that there are six clones, which is not going to do anyone any good. But by campaigning on this, and actually immediately should we win this, and we know that there are many politicians who would like to see this done, not all Labour politicians, some Conservative politicians who are so fed up with, the, with being attacked by uh, media as well on, on spurious ground. We know that there, are, there is willingness to support this. This is just saying there should be six voices in these markets. If we got the campaign going, that raises the issues. It wouldn't completely transform the media, but it would stop two companies in the national newspaper market. Um, news. Uh, as they're now called, um, the News Corporation, that's Murdoch's, mm -hmm. and uh, the Daily Mail Group. And I'm sure you know the Daily Mail Group because they have pretty much the world's um, uh, busiest news website. It would affect just those two, but it would be, I think, a very big symbolic act to say your power is unacceptable and is unhealthy for British democracy. So we gave a number because we were sick of people saying this is all very abstract. Where's your policy? So we came up with a policy, 20% maximum and if you go over that there are many different things you can do there can be um, you know um, shareholders buying they, you know we want shareholder democracy they could buy some back let's deal with these issues but there should be a absolute ceiling on ownership is it is it the issue you will bring to the parties to, uh, as an issue during election campaigns do you do you debate it with any political actor yeah, we've had lots of discussions with, with the Labour Party, mo mostly. We've had individual meetings with some of the other parties. But Labour, and there is, there is in the UK, there is a civil so society consensus over this. It, by no means my group, we came up with figures, but we have now met enough times that there is pretty much an agreement for all the media campaigners. That means hacked off, who are the biggest 
the most important campaign who represent the victims of phone hacking, all the way through to the National Union of Journalists, everyone agrees, mm -hmm. and we have written the documents for Labour. But you can write any document you want. If the political will is not there to run with it, then it will not happen. And we've been told that the main reason this will not happen is because when they go knocking on someone's door to ask for their vote, the electoral issues are in Britain, it's immigration, the health service, jobs, unemployment. They don't say, we need to stop the Murdoch Empire. And that's their excuse for saying, therefore, we don't need to do anything about it. And that, again, it's a, it's a problem. Helena, how do you see in Slovenia the issue of ownership? Uh, we were uh, from privatization to concentration. Many things happen. And now there is overall crisis, but still we have several players dominating the area. Even in your field, uh, commercial broadcasts are with two channels, uh, the most visited website and so on. So you have huge actors, and in print media the same, uh, still dominating. And, and in fact, you still see, uh, despite a kind of uh, industry weakening, that political capture of those actors and fight around them is there. Do you see any, how to say, political group or, or media group willing to change these patterns? In a positive way? You yeah, change them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't see because anyone elections from now. like institutional mm -hmm. point of view. No, I don't believe there is one institution, but ra rather vice versa. Of course, everybody are fighting because in TV ratings are the most important. Even the public television now adopted this philosophy. Of course, it works with different funds than the commercial TV and has different um, um, roles to play because it has to give space to the minorities and all the other issues that commercial television will never do. And of course, if they have American owners, which is the pop TV, they work in the American way. When we try to look into the working processes, they're totally Americanized, so. But the issue of ownership, I would like to go beyond these, these big groups. Uh, for instance, journalists as owners, uh, that used to be at the privatization uh, start, and now some initiative to take over ownership in some big media from uh, uh, disappearing owners or something is still uh, uh, not, not succeeding. I don't what know. about uh, this? I don't have such good information. But now with the Vichir being on sale, uh, who will buy it, whether it will be Salomon Group, which is a company with dodgy, um, other companies and mm -hmm. connections, they also run the actually a garbage disposal company, if I understand correctly. Yeah? So you might have a brewery and a garbage disposal company yeah. running Slovenian newspapers. Yeah. Actually, yeah. The metaphors are too. Fantastic and the brewery here. is actually selling this newspaper, yeah? To garbage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> probably, oh, right. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and the problem, why, and with the Vichir, with the selling of Vichir, there was this uh, experiment, we can call it like that that journalists or people who are employed in the newspaper try to form a cooperative. So they would buy it and run it, but of course this is the basic problem here in journalism in Slovenia, uh, nobody has the money. So this project was unsuccessful. Of course there are these discussions we, are, we have been discussing to form a cooperative or something else, but we are not Spain, unfortunately. Eh? Because the cooperatives there work in Slovenia, not even one cooperative actually is really successful, maybe some small, mm -hmm. but going... In five years, journalists change to uh, buying uh, newspaper. We will see, you know. Uh, so I think this, this is the biggest problem. Of course, if you want to have the cooperative, we don't have the laws. Still, the problem is on the national level because we don't, even if you can establish, register a cooperative, 
but you cannot, let's say, run for the same funds as uh, tradition. Well, of course, you're treated the same as a traditional capitalistic organization. Yeah. Mm. So this is the law, the basic law that we are missing here. And yeah, the biggest problem is the money. Where is the money? <laughs> uh, in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, do, any question from the audience on this ownership concentration, journalists' initiatives in uh, cooperatives? Mattia, do you have any comment on that? No. Leonard wrote, Leonard wrote many articles about the, the problems of ownership in Slovenia, about the concentration, so maybe he can introduce uh, some of his uh, conclusions about things uh, in Slovenia um, regarding ownership. Mm -hmm. Lena, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> this is like, has okay. no choice. Let's, because we are a really small group, let's discuss it together. Well, well what, what we found out is that it's not easy to change former state monopolies into private enterprises. I mean, you can do it formally, but uh, you know, before 19, what? 89, you had no private media, meaning no media managers, no media market, no media anything that, has, that you could say that you have a market or private companies. And um, what happened was we don't, even now, we don't really know what to do with ownership. And I don't think that it's just a problem of uh, journalists not having money, but uh, if we recall how we select our editors-in-chief in all of our organizations, you know, those people have no or almost no support from the collective. So uh, if you ask, you know, would I trust my money to people running my newspaper at this moment? I would say, well, hell no. And uh, this basic trust, you know, to being able to not only to run the business, but to be able to trust somebody that he or she is capable of doing so without becoming a part of one specific vested group, it's almost impossible. And that's also part of the problem. You have uh, some attempts by really small players trying to do crowdsourcing, uh, getting individual donors trying to do something, but they are so tiny and even their chances of success are minimal. Uh, what we do have is uh, two strong televisions, um, three, let's say, two players on newspaper media market, some regional players, and um, not only that those facts are not even known among journalists, for example, if you read comments and analysis when it comes to media takeovers or finding new owners or whatever, it's kind of funny because uh, Brankitsa could probably tell you more about that because she's been uh, managing projects on media ownership and media issues for how long? For, for 15 years yeah, at least. Yeah. And uh, they're not even the stuff we produced are not even read by the media or the politicians. So you, you just, it's funny, you know, all this information is missing. It's still, I think, a non-issue. And another thing that I will also stress is that um, all the debates on media and journalism are mostly run by NGOs or politicians. You have almost zero debates in the media on the media about the media. And uh, the discourse is almost totally led by either the NGOs who are more or less having very similar values to the other s media reform groups. So let's say good intentions, pluralism, uh, professional journalism, media ownership, reform, etc. Uh, claiming that yeah, those things would be good for the media space. Uh, or you have the politicians who only know how to, how can I say, um, blame the media for almost everything that's happening in the country. 
and uh, the media themselves s accepted this idea of we have that we have like left media and right media, and uh, both are totally partisan, and uh, it became pretty normal that they support either one political group or another political group. And uh, even now, before the elections, you can see that uh, only those polarized opinions are in the media. Y you can't hear any alternative voices, almost. Which happens every time, you know, when you do have political movements. We discussed that in the morning, because uh, yes. we were sitting uh, just uh, at Kavarna Zvezda uh, Congress in Turg, and I explained that almost 10,000 people were there protesting. Uh, and uh, that most of people who were there felt totally under and misrepresented by the media. And the media, it was funny as an insider to watch how they were totally puzzled because for, what, a week they couldn't find a person to talk to. You know, who leads <laughs> the whole thing? Yeah, who's the leader? Who's the leader? Uh, and yeah. Okay, now, I think it's it, quite a few issues, but... Um, yeah, media fell for the, on the political arguments, yeah? Political discourse. They adopted it in terms of these protests, yeah? Because mm -hmm. the government was, okay, now who's the protest? Because this protest was not um, submitted to the police, of course. Right. So they yeah, said, yeah. oh, this is illegal. But when you have 10,000 people in Ljubljana, that happened in 1990, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, I was a bit young then, but... Do you have this? Do you have that uh, uh, feeling in the in the UK in your activism research that people, on general, even journalists, still think that ownership doesn't matter or it, that it's not so important, and they they focus on uh, some political or, or or content issues, and this is this is well, not. Huh? Traditionally, people have focused on content issues. So the only time that you would ever as I put it, the only time that the ordinary member of the public would engage with media policy is when they were swearing on television and they, they would ring up and complain, and that was their media policy activism. That really has changed. I think the amount of issues to do with uh, social media, net neutrality, I think that's helping to change the atmosphere. But I think Leveson has really changed the atmosphere. So Leonard's point that the media don't report on themselves. Now, at one level, of course they don't. Why would they? But they do report in the business pages. So the only time that the media talk about themselves, and they, they're happy to do this, is as you know, commodities. So the business page is fine. Who's buying who? Mm -hmm. What was so incredible about Leveson in the UK is that pretty much for the first time, the structures and behavior and even the ethics, who would have believed that, of the media were on the front pages. It became the news item because they didn't know how to avoid it and because there were celebrities involved. But they didn't really understand how they could bypass it. And the key thing for us, because otherwise we lapse into complete pessimism, the key lesson is that life is very unpredictable, that you have to have the confidence to think that the media may not be the, the number one issue on the doorstep, but it's often it's... I don't know if glue's the right word, but it's, it's a connecting. You know, the media do mediate between other institutions and individuals. And so our understanding of key political issues does partly come through the media. So it's there even if we don't identify it. So things just pop out. I'm always inspired by what happened in Mexico um, a couple of years back. Mexican, I mean, if there is, if there is corruption in Slovenia, then go to Mexico where you learn about real corruption. So there is real corruption, not least between the two main TV networks who have a huge monopolistic control of broadcast television and they are absolutely absorbed within mainstream political structures. And what happens? A crazy bunch of students ahead of the election took to the streets. It was a student movement and for some strange reason what really annoyed them at that moment was what they saw as this utterly corrupt duopoly of Televisa and TV Azteca which was, they thought was undermining their democracy. None of us could have predicted it. In fact, the, the fantastic civil society activists in Mexico didn't lead it. It was, who's the leader? Well, no one. They just had enough. And the 15,000 people in the square down the road from here 
their anger hasn't gone away. It may not be mobilized in ways that we can predict or understand, but they will, the media will be one of their targets. And I think for a room of people like this, all the time it's trying to learn the lessons. It's trying to provide opportunities for us to launch our own media. It's trying to support people who are inside the mainstream media trying to do good things and trying to carve out those spaces. It's media education work. Um, but all the time, it, it is also just saying the media will not change from the inside. That's where I am. I think we have to be realistic. The media will have to be forced to be changed, and regulators will, will be part of that movement. Let's stop here about this self-regulation concept that uh, was from UK very early in 90s, suggested to us, PCC, Press Complaint Commission, uh, well, was around. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to question you about that. Uh, can you explain, was it ev uh, to you, let's say, and to your group, even at that point in the 90s, clear that industry will not regulate itself to serve ethics and citizens? Well, or did you believe it early and uh, now it's clear? Were you naive at that time? Yeah, <laughs> you'll never, why would you believe me? No, the answer is no. And it was quite simple because the record of the PCC, this is just, this is the press self-regulator, was always so terrible. Because Britain has had, I've now lost track, I think it's seven investigations into the press. And each time, because things blow up, and each time a new form of self-regulation is called for, and each time the press destroy it. Mm -hmm. And they have something on their side, which is a very powerful tool to have on your side, which is they represent the freedom of the press. Now, I'd, I don't want to undermine that. In fact, we're trying to protect and make it real, the freedom of the press, because I don't believe we have a free press now. It's too much at the mercy of private interests. But they have the newspapers. They have the amplifiers. So they are able to associate their right to run a newspaper with the freedom of the press. So they have always won the argument. And self-regulation, when it is in particular institutions, that it is, as we now call it, it's, they are marking their own homework. And I don't really, I'm not sure if I would trust my own kid to mark his own homework. Um, it needs democratic oversight. And the record has always been terrible for press self-regulation because it's financed and run by the industry. As simple as that. And we are seeing all of this replayed again. It's, it is much more complicated when it comes to broadcast regulation, which of course is not self-regulation. And all these arguments that the press say, you cannot, regulation means the end of free media. It means, it means Ahmadinejad, as was in Iran. It means Mugabe in Zimbabwe. To which we say, um, what about television? They have quite strict regulation. Have they, are they not free? But that's not an argument that has won. So no, I've never believed in it. I think self-regulation has always been, in the context of the UK and the US, a tool used by the industry to protect themselves. Now it's different in different places. If you have authoritarian regimes, then a degree of self-regulation may, in particular circumstances, protect people. I don't know, that's for other countries to decide. But in terms of so-called advanced liberal democracies with very high concentrations of private ownership, self-regulation allows the industry to shove two fingers up to everyone else. And that has not worked for the public. Let's move to public service broadcasting. Beside this commercial uh, segment of the, of the media sector and industry, we do have also public service broadcasters or some would like to say public service media, including those websites and so on. In our case, it's, it goes from crisis to crisis, from law to governing models and so on, and uh, in fact never gaining the kind of reputation of public service. Why, Helena, you think it is the case? Well, as you said it, actually, very nicely, uh, and I said it before, it was hijacked by the politics, and it's obvious who is running um, 
the program, when the government changes, the whole board of management usually changes. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not somebody who is from the industry, who knows the media, who is a specialist, who can do a good program. But it's usually somebody who is the right political colors, yeah? This is one thing that in mean, the last, actually, I, well, in October, I will be at the TV station for like five, 15 years. So in this time, at least two laws were changed that affected this radio public broadcaster so hard that it, will, it went back for 10, 15 years technologically, etc. We are not competitive anymore. A lot of people left because of this political interference. And this is, we lost the whole generation of good journalists. And this media was the one media who had the biggest and best spe media specialists, especially in the terms of broadcast, because they brought this TV up. And today I'm in the news program, I'm one of the older journalists. So you can imagine what kind of situation we are now. And the biggest problem is, of course, the program board, because the two thirds of them is, are named by the parliament, including myself. and <laughs> so sorry. I don't know if I repeat the same sentence I told you before. You know, lobotomy is like less painful. They're sitting in there because they don't talk about the content. Of course, they take um, they take the time and role, and they think they can um, give us the recipe how to report. Of course because the news program is the most important. They don't care about the educational program, documentary, etc. It's the news. And um, during the protests, of course, we were reporting about the protests, like any normal media, yeah? Um, they actually got the agreement that they forbid us to report about that. And the same thing happened a few weeks ago about the prime minister going to the court, whether he will now uh, get this sentence and go to jail or not. And of course, there were some protests already announced, and we were forbidden to report about that because this board was afraid that the other protests, these left fascists will come also, and we are now driving the agenda. Mm -hmm. So this is a big problem, and of course, the Public radio and TV is still one of the biggest companies in this country. That was my point. I, I want to say that in all over distrust and crisis of model of financing the media, we in fact have the model of this public service media financed by citizens and so on. And in, in such uh, countries like Slovenia, or I am now quite uh, present in the Balkans, it is the biggest, the richest media in, in countries, you know? Yeah. But and, it's badly and, managed. And collapsing, collapsing in terms of finances, Croatian and Serbian, huge, you know, but in minuses, you know? And that is, that is the qu huge question. If it doesn't work, you know, what will work? We will come to this non-profit citizens uh, media and so on. But this is a, a great challenge to me also as an advocate of public service. But uh, I, have a question for, no, I have a question for yeah. you. How can we call this public service? So public service is just, if it just means it's a, a mechanism of funding that the public pay, that's not what we really understand by public service broadcasting. Public service media and public service broadcasting are, are more philosophical in their origins, which is about delivering a service independent of, um, of vested interests for the public. Now, what you're describing cannot be seen as, as meaningful public service broadcasting. And I'm not sitting here saying that that's because the BBC is a perfect model of this. The BBC st has to earn its status as a public service broadcaster, and it is done too many things which have undermined those relationships, still it commands the trust of most British people, which is, for a major institution, it's pretty remarkable in Britain because all the other public institutions have lost all their trust. But that's the question. I mean, 
you have direct experience with it. On what basis would you say that it is a public service broadcaster? There are many, there are many formal but also concrete issues like these program issues of producing. I was the researcher monitoring prime time production and uh, representation of women mm. of between commercial and, and, and public service uh, uh, channels. And this is remarkable what, what public service television one is airing in terms of children program, in terms of debate program and so on, uh, sports program. There are many dimensions of that that no other media in, you know, but serving this. But when we come to, uh, come to uh, uh, political, it's, it's pretty much, how to say, uh, captured by e interest and so on. And sometimes even news program manage to do great things, uh, certain, certain, certain programs and items and so on. But it's, it's very difficult. I would not say that in, in Slovenia, RTV Slovenia is not a public service broadcasting completely. It has its, it has its good point, but it is, it is in this governing model, when majority of governing body is appointed by the parliament, and it's, it's, com it's, it's p completely clear how it works, it's one of the, of the main, how to say, disturbing point, destroying point. And that's the, because that body appoints um, uh, director general, and yeah. then it yeah. goes down. Program it's directors, etc. And it, it, it's, then, it's then destroying this potential. But what I want to ask you, as a, again, besides self-regulation that you exported to our region as a model, uh, although not to... Uh, we adopted partly BBC's code not to the to be, uh, uh, how to say, uh, no, to be fair to Slovenian journalists, you had here Chasno uh, Rasodišče, not before press complaint commission was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, around in this region, but still it was pushing, for instance, Slovenian uh, uh, Ethics Council, that is self-regulatory body of journalists, used to work alone, you know, like uh, dealing with complaints by citizens yeah. regarding journalist behavior. But then the model from Britain, from Germany, was pushing us, transition countries, to involve industry representatives and public representatives in the self-regulation, saying that journalists are not enough, let's bring owners. And journalists sustained in, in saying no for 10 years saying, forget about this European model, we, will we don't trust owners to sit with us in self-regulatory body. So this is, but another model is this BBC, you know, and it still stays as a remarkable, you know, model in front of us. But uh, what is going on in terms of your uh, media reform fight in, in, uh, related to BBC? What are your demands? Do you have any? Um, Frankly, no. You like the system? No, because it's... Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Because you pick your fights. Okay. Um, it's awkward. Pa I, I think officially, particularly with the, with the media initiative, this is, as you saw in the video, this is about private media power. And so, um, and to do with Leveson and phone hacking, this was what we identified as something that was clearly wrong with the concentration of private media power. So that's where we were aiming the campaign. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that there are some structural flaws and many, many issues that we should deal with in terms of public service broadcasting, as I would see it, to rescue mm -hmm. the principle of public service broadcasting from some of the managers who are undermining it. Um, but that's not overt in this campaign, but it's a, it's a huge issue because we're about to enter another period of navel-gazing because of the next BBC Charter. So the next two years is going to be filled with all of these debates, and it will, there, is a, there is such a defensiveness on the part already of the BBC um, that this is an austerity times. How can we justify taking money off people? What's so crazy is the Murdoch, you know, you pay TV, is three, four times as expensive. And they don't beat themselves around with whips saying, how can we take money off poor people? It's only the BBC who do that. So they should be not as um, defensive, but they also have to be much more accountable. They're a public broadcaster. 
It cannot be that you just have a lack of accountability. So they have to find ways of, I think, of, of rebuilding the relationship between the broadcaster and the public, and I think trust would go up. But in fact, what can be a demand in, in, in Euro European wide, and in fact it, it is to defend public service broadcasting yeah. from attempts to destroy them. Well, going back to Tanya's point, um, you know, where you're absolutely right that it's national governments that are the key in this. But Brussels doesn't help in the sphere of public service broadcasting because the BBC, as the biggest public service broadcaster, has internalised much of the logic of what Brussels is saying, which is about state aid. And it's made it, it's so defensive, whatever it wants to do any other service, its first thought is what will be the impact on the commercial market. Mm -hmm. Now I don't think that's helpful at all because they're not equivalent systems. Public service broadcasting is not just a publicly funded version. It's mm -hmm. a different form of, different type of culture. It's an intervention into media markets. In fact, it's the active counterpart. It's the opposite of a private media market. So why is it being judged up against a private media market? And that's a real, that's a real issue that, that I would facing. like to ask you this, but maybe no, Helena I have a that. comment. In our country, it, it, there is a kind, even a, a kind of clear distinction between of right and left wing politics political groups understanding of public service broadcasting as a model and 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 uh, uh, it seems like you know um, through through the history of regulation of the system and even today when i am sitting there and debating there are uh, clear ideas by right conservative groups that once you win the elections it's your natural right to control the, the public service broadcaster. And then leftists are pretending that it is, in fact, to give it to civil society. But then they try to control it through that. But do you see in, in Britain, because I see uh, 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 the, dif the difference? Not, not at all. There isn't, a, there isn't any clear left-right split. The, the, the free marketeer right historically has tried to undermine the BBC and uh, have subscription. The, the equivalent on the left, the, the radical left, have always seen the BBC as the establishment par excellence and as a problem. Mm -hmm. So you get, you get soft conservatives, as we call them, the wets, who are in love with the BBC because it represents all a continuity of the British establishment. They're much more pro-BBC than the left. So the left-right split is, mu is very complicated. I suspect much more complicated than it, than it is, I don't know, in terms of Slovenia? Um, they're less split. Less <laughs> yeah. They're more around the center, I would say. And as you said, the difference I, I see between the right-wing parties and left, left does it more sophisticatedly. Eh? Mm. If they want to interfere, do they, they do it more quietly, like through the civil society, and it's not they don't promote this so loudly as their agenda. We are now again before the elections and the right-wing party as they has, is again promoting that they will cut the fees for the public TV, yeah. huh. public broadcast, broadcaster for, for as half, as much as half, yeah? And will change the law immediately. They probably have <laughs> another law or they will just, you know, yeah. I don't know. Do you have any questions around these issues? Uh, and, and uh, it is half past eight, if I see uh, mm -hmm. correctly, maybe 10 more minutes or something like that. Spela, is it OK? Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Mr. Bergant, you are more at home with this. No? <laughs> you will just listen to Maybe yourself. I would like to say something more. Well, yeah. uh, uh, Please. I, I have to defend yes, yes. Uh, public <laughs> service broadcasting. Yeah. I, I think uh, we are much better than comparable countries in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. which I'm dealing with. This is not a high recommended note, <laughs> but, uh, but it is better. Our problem is actually <coughs> uh, there are elements uh, which are much better than they used to be several years ago. Unfortunately, we have two problems. One problem is the law, which has actually uh, changed the governance from, I would say, direct, whatever it was, uh, civil society impact into uh, a reserve um, uh, field of politics because everybody who is 
including our distinguished uh, uh, yeah. panelist, uh, uh, who is member of this council, except of very few exemptions, which are minorities and uh, uh, religious uh, representatives, has to be confirmed in the parliament. And of course, in a parliament where you have to have a major majority for, for every vote, uh, it is clear how the outcome is. And I think uh, this is the, the worst thing that we have ac actually faced during the last 10 years, this negative uh, impact, which earlier was not so clear. It was clear because the people who have been representing civil society have been probably biased. But I mean, the system was much better. The second thing is, I think, um, um, I don't think that the politicians does, does, don't understand. They understand very well. Therefore, we have this uh, situation. But the, the problem is in house. Um, um, you know, we have a plural broadcasting. You cannot say that it is really pro governmental. But this pluralism is wrongly understood. It is understood that you have to have a balance between all parties uh, represented in Parliament. Okay, and um, uh, we have, first of all, too much politics. And the second thing is, of course, why we have so much politics? Because the editors, particularly editors, not journalists, understand that if they will represent really each party's, I don't know, press conference, uh, then they, that will be regarded as a, a plural, which I and think objective. is absolutely wrong. No? I mean, they, and there are elements, very positive elements, you should accept that. Uh, they are now thinking much more stronger about contents than it used to be three or four years ago. There is inside of the house a positive movement. First time they are defending independence of public broadcasting. That was not the case before. Uh, but they should change within the, the structures and to redefine what is actually pluralistic approach. Pluralistic approach should be that it is a broadcasting which decides by themselves, by, by, by himself, itself, whatever, uh, the content. That it is not, you know, a balance of everybody, and if you bring everybody, then you are pluralistic. No, you should choose yeah. what is important for the society and what is not important for the society. And that should be their judgment and not judgment of governing bodies. Uh, that is the problem. Currently, but uh, I mean, you should know. I have to do to 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 say this broadcast in Kiri is much better than comparable so broadcasters around. Well, we started with a different position than of they course, did. Of course, and you have you to say this it. also that the Slovenian public service was not in the same position as the Hungarian, yeah, but in the nineties or Polish. But no, I would like to hear those uh, who are these these ideas, movements of protecting the public service. I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> yeah. you are Within the I understood you are a part of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, really, I remember, uh, you remember, you are too young, but I have to remind you, 91, we had first attempt to grasp this public service broadcasting by one single politician and so on, which is continuing, of course. And at that time, it was the only time when we had really a common feeling that we have to defend this house. Always afterwards, there have been very hard to get people around to, you know, to, to get a critical mass to, to do something positive for the... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, there but is now, in moment. recent two years, this has tremendously changed. And I'm, of course, it is yeah. mainly not uh, mainstream. Uh, orientation, but it is better than any time. Yeah, and if you listen time. to the uh, also political programs, particularly to this um, uh, 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 program of maybe, you have also very often something in favor of independence of public service broadcasting. It was never the case in this house. Not to mention a lot of radio programs recently when uh, legislation was, uh, you know, changed or improved or whatever. I, I think improved in negative sense. But, uh, but, but there are changes. And the uh, output is, of course, uh, maybe you are, you are uh, looking at that every day. You don't see it, but I am not looking every day because I cannot, but I look r rarely. 
But then I am very positively surprised, really. Okay. Yeah, but I just want to say something else. Of course, to the worst period since I'm on TV, I, uh, I arrived in 1999, uh, was from 2004 to 2008. And at the end of the 2008, all people who are full-time employed in the public uh, radio and television, uh, and also the net, became public service. Public in servants. Uh, public servants, yes. So, this is one problem we have. Well, why? You should say why. Of course, because some people, but because of course... A minority of refugees I, I just exactly. want not this to... This is the problem we don't have. Not to spend just last minutes of our talk not touching any other, uh, uh, how to say, part of the media sphere. This dualism, commercial, public service, is something that, that we also uh, how, how so, took for granted. But there are obviously people escaping from commercial media, from public service media, not to mention citizens themselves, yeah. academics themselves, running, trying to run some open models of media platforms, mostly online and so on. Uh, I would like to challenge you on that. Is it, is it something that has a kind of future and uh, can be a kind of real, general alternative to these two models, which obviously both, at least in, in our cases, hardly serve public interest in the media? The, the, can, can we uh, rely on these new, new initiatives? You are in one open democracy, and, and, and there, are, there are various uh, around in, in Slovenia mushrooming, you know, mainly online. W how to consider them? Well, there's a, formally, you can say pluralism is very healthy because there are an increasing number of different outlets and the barrier to entry has gone down. So formally speaking, I think, you know, you could, there are more voices. But real plurality has to be about securing the conditions in which all these different types of, um, uh, of types of media can take place. It's not enough for me just to say, you know, social movements will have their own media. Yes, they will, and they need to, and it's, it's very important they do. Yes, we want some community media. Britain has a long tradition of pirate media. Fantastic. But I do think there has to be some kind of structural reforms which provides a real basis for different models to exist. Now, I think it's very interesting. It's not much has been written about it, and what has been written has been very negative. The reforms in Argentina. The reforms in Argentina have been very politically contentious to break apart the, the major media monopoly, Clarín, and to divide the airwaves in three ways, public broadcasting, private, and community. They have enforced mm -hmm. one third of the airways for community stations. By law. Now it's bit by law. Mm -hmm. Now it, people have criticised it. It's against freedom of speech, and the, the the president has done it only because she was being attacked by the private group. Maybe that's all true, but that is a means of embedding the conditions for pluralism. I don't think it's enough just to say we got a few websites, open democracy. I mean, frankly, mm -hmm. we, we need more. Um, we need more structure than that. Um, and, and, and I think there's obviously a huge willingness. You know, now we have the technological conditions in which to do this. But it, there needs to be um, the, the discussions of funding. I mean, it's political priorities. It's, if, if the British government took community broadcasting seriously, it would put some money into this. It's, you know, Ofcom have spent so long developing the infrastructure for community radio, but there's no money in it. That's not their fault. That's the government's decision. So there has to be the political will. When it comes to um, you know, very easy things, local, this is probably less relevant for Slovenia, but in Britain, the regional and local press is declining catastrophically. And that, something has to be done. And it's easy for the local, for, it's very concentrated. And these big companies are saying, we can't sustain the losses. Why, if the government thought this was important, why wouldn't they introduce changes to tax law? Why wouldn't they amend charity legislation so that there could be many more empl employee buyouts, maybe co-ops, just the kind of easy things to do, which gives a very strong signal that says, you know, actually we subsidise all sorts of other, um, you know, nuclear power plants. There's lots of public money that goes to underwrite that. What, why not in the media? And one final point, I might actually make one final point, which is you made brilliant, 
lots of really good points. I didn't mean to say that, that either that Slovenian public service broadcasting is not public service broadcasting, or that it's just as, as bad as some of the others. But I think we should always ask the question. It has to earn its trust. What is it doing? To, to, to justify itself. And the problem with the BBC, which I spent far too long listening and, and watching, so I, you know, most of my, too much of my life is taken up with it, so I feel entitled to ask questions of it. And in terms of news, you know, we take, as academics, one thing we can do is every now and again come up with some empirical evidence. And the empirical evidence shows that BBC's coverage of major geopolitical issues is often narrower, narrower than the commercial public service channels. And my final point is that it is no accident that there's going to be a very big national anti-austerity demonstration in London on Saturday. And you know where it's starting from? Outside television centre of the BBC. It's never done this before. It was always parks, squares. They're starting out to the BBC because there is a, there is a perception that the BBC has for too long been allowed to get away with it. And that the evidence has showed that it is softer on the bankers, softer on big business, softer on um, neoconservatives, and, and it shouldn't be. So we need to regain, it, it needs to regain our trust. And fortunately, it's easier to have that battle with the public service broadcaster because we have people like you. We have spaces. You, we don't have any spaces inside News Corp, in, inside um, uh, B Sky B. So it's very important that we take those spaces seriously. But I think we should not be complacent. But what is your opinion, Helena, about these um, websites, platforms, where journalists and citizens try to rebuild some, some type of journalism, public communication that is more pro-public? Yeah, in terms of networking and communicating, it's OK. It has its own future, but for like that said, that for social movements, but not, I don't believe it, not in the short time, at least not in Slovenia, I don't see the net taking over the traditional media. Because still I think the Slovenian, wo Slovenian watchers and uh, <coughs> people who watch TV are but more what, conservative. But in terms of pra <coughs> practicing, pra practicing public service journalism is, do you see the future there? Can 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 you? S I, me personally, I I have complete distrust that this type of journalism can any longer exist in commercial sector. No, uh, m rather as an accident. Now, at public service broadcasting, maybe, but what about this? Because I see r really people with which are mostly dedicated to public service type of journalism escaping both models and trying to find space online. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, for a writer it's more free space. That hap not, it's not happening only here, it, it's happening right. everywhere because of the problems we stated at the, in the beginning, because the capital and political pressures in the traditional media are so harsh that not everybody can stand it, so they maybe rather change freedom for unemployment, yeah? Be free and unemployed. And one thing I wanted to state before, what I see is the main problem and is killing the traditional media and the journalism itself, it's the precarization of the media. When you don't have uh, financial independence, you cannot be in the, you cannot report independently. This is one thing. Yeah. The other thing is also bad editors, as Boris said. This is our main problem. Not because the people who work are incompetent, don't, uh, are not creative. Mm. This is also this big lie everybody say about people who work for public TV and radio because they pay it and they can say everything. We are all drunks and we are all lazy. We never work, yeah? Now, um, when you mentioned that, I want to use, just because you, you mentioned that, uh, uh, a moment for p promotion, but uh, our institute did a research in the Southeast Europe on media integrity and uh, reflecting integrity of policy ownership and so on, but also journalists uh, as, a, as a profession. And what we found out is the uh, uh, most depressive part of our research was about journalists 
being is it's such a bad labor situation in the Balkans that that it is it impo impossible to understand what yeah. is going on because majority of journalists receive less salaries lo lower than average in the country. Yeah, they are around minimum wage, between minimum and average, and it, let's say. It, 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 it is but m many And, and then famous. another point is that they consider editors as a bigger problem in the profession, yeah. being censors, being yeah. together with tycoons, with mafia, and so on. Politics. So what is, what is, what is destroying, in, in fact, according to this research in that part, journalism as a profession is uh, partly this economic situation, which is, which is uh, degradating the profession completely, yep. and then the role of s s those who used to be the best of journalists. And, and now, uh, in fact, completely puppets of, of uh, some verse of w what our society have in politics and in business. Uh, and uh, that, is, that is something which, which what we can ha find also in Slovenia in, in, at some points. Yeah. And the public broadcaster, this is the ironic thing, uh, actually brought the precarization into the Slovenia media space because it's the biggest company even today there is 17 around 1700 employed people and half of them are on contracts self-employed journalists etc I would like just to ask it was now too long from our side just a few more comments not to conclude with our voices just to hear your voices I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just wanted. To, I was just thinking before. It's not relating on these last things that you you were saying, but um, it's obvious if you if we we were debating a lot about Slovenia and media law and law on radio, television, and blah blah blah, and we saw how inefficient these laws are and how hard is is it is to even to to get the the better law, how there is no political will, there is notion by politicians that it's our media, it's our uh, public television, uh, it's biased media, we need to change this, we need to get our editors in chief, we need to sell or buy media to, to influence the content and things like that. So we are having this on national level. And then we are, we are, um, we are um, wondering why is it like that on Brussels level? It's the same. It's it's just the the. I see it is but just the, the. I have the answer on that. I'm Sorry, I will. It's continue. the same. There the, there are the same politicians. Yes, you know exactly. why why should they have any other notion about the media or you know how to solve the problems? They all they just want the same, to have their own media, to get their agenda in this media, to stay in power or to g get the power or to get the money. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's the same. Not only that, it's the same. They are the same. They, of course, you yes. Know? Mr. Frattini is politician in Italy when he's commissioner, he's not another person. He's the same person. Or, or Mr. Zver, or if he if he gain such position, God knows, you know. But th this is this is the the same politicians which are not in favor of media freedom at home, <laughs> and and just pretend uh, for a while that uh, in Brussels they are they are something else, but they are not. And the, can you this comment on that? But why we have such a feeling that European Union? Uh, uh, Political actors can act differently than our national. Well, you should never ask someone from the UK to comment. <laughs> on <your laughs> yeah, 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 because I'm the, I'm you're the, the last one huh, <laughs> to trust. Uh, ex exactly. Um, but but there, there is probably, especially with us, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, new members, you know, to whom it was like a hope. <laughs> You know that we will escape some kind of non-democratic patterns in our politics by becoming a member. 
and and now it's a bit bit of uh, disappointment. And Brankica, it was like that when we're, we were still a candidate country. Yeah. Yeah. We we were having the best uh, law on radio television. You know, the Council of Europe they were like celebrating yeah. us. They model. were uh, selling us as as uh, model uh -huh. law. You know. And immediately when we get to to be a member of EU, you know, the we got this uh, correction of of the law, you know, as all other EU, old EU states, you know. Well, you've so answered your own question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they okay. the EU wants to be better, but but it just uh, it's not able to be better, obviously. But it is uh, just it's a waste of money. <laughs> just to conclude, in in the context of the pluralism initiative, we want citizens to sign if they watch us through the webs website to sign that initiative to help us uh, generate that that public attitude that we want media to serve people and public interest. And we want European Union to intervene because as most our regulation now only come into force if it is uh, ad adopted by Brussels, a lot of that. So uh, and it, it, it's, it's probably good to try to bring some improvements to Euro European-wide uh, legislation action. Uh, the, the path of the European uh, Union's policy making, m making is towards the deregulation and it will happen uh, again uh, the next year where, where, uh, when uh, the directive on audiovisual media services will be opened once again. Uh, and I, I, I feel that we can expect more deregulation, more promotion of self-regulation, more promotion of British models of self-regulation, because you <laughs> are all, always uh, quoted uh, as a role model in uh, product placement, in regulation on video demand services and so on. But so our, our uh, request now in this initiative is beyond audiovisual directive. It's mm -hmm. mostly, as it is for last 15 years, is targeting concentration and ownership. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is something which we do hope that can be addressed at least with some instruments on European level so that, that uh, and also independence of regulators and these type of universal standards through, through regulation. Yeah, uh, uh, last year uh, the Commission launched another uh, public consultation on independence of the regulatory authorities. I think only 11 countries replied. Uh, Slovenia was not among them. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but but I, what I want li would like, oh, sorry to interrupt you, Tanya, is it is, it is a, obviously a problem of not taking part in consultations in Brussels on new regulation, but uh, this, this is just a, a symptom. It does not mean that uh, people are not interested at all and that the change is not necessary. I know what I we want to say. But, but always the Commission also say, look, some little mm -hmm. comments, forget about it. No, but they want it. They push, uh, they strongly push this agenda uh, forward. And they even established uh, now a, a, a form of super regulator or supra regulator on, on the uh, supranational uh, level. It is called. Uh, well, I, I am exaggerating calling it supra-regulator because it's a platform of national regulatory authorities established by the Commission, yeah. uh, by the decision of the Commission. But I th I'm afraid that the real motives behind this are just uh, the circumvention of the national policies coming uh, straight uh, to the regulators, avoiding the, the national governments, and having a direct dialogue with the regulators that have a direct relationships with the industry in the countries. Is I think it good this is or the. Bad? Uh, I wouldn't say it's good. It's <laughs> I'm that. afraid it's not. I'm afraid it's uh, it is another step into uh, reinforcing the single market that has a, a lot of disruptive effects on the national markets. We still 
pretend we have national markets, but we don't <laughs> anymore. We, we are a part of a globalized uh, system. Maybe in, in UK it's not so evident, but in, in Slovenia we have a lot of disruptive effects from the country of origin principle. Uh, everybody ca can uh, come to this small market with a small advertising budget and without respecting our uh, requirements, program requirements. I'm talking mostly from the perspective of audiovisual media, but I think uh, these effects are coming also to, to the field of other media. And we, and we, we can have a perfect legislation, perfect le nat national legislation, but maybe it won't have any effect because people will watch foreign channels will read foreign news, uh, foreign news media that won't be re even regulated. And so uh, I'm wondering what can we do? I'm maybe uh, pessimistic, but I, I really cannot see uh, some, some solution. Yeah, maybe you can. Marco. Um, no, I'm afraid I'm not giving the solution or offering the solution. I'm offering an additional reason for concern, which is that we are talking right now about the European level, but we would need to focus even wider on, like you said, on a global level, because the European Union is actually a small player in a worldwide context. And what we should be concerned is not just the national levels and so on, which are, of course, important for us individually, but the power is moving more and more to US to, to providers like Apple, to providers like Amazon, to providers like, um, like Netflix and all the others, uh, and of course Google, uh, which, are, which are really dominating all of the relevant markets in different areas, whether it's search uh, engines or whether it's uh, banner advertising and so on. I think that when you say that UK is in a slightly different position, but when it comes to um, uh, internet advertising, I think that something like 70 or 80 percent of internet advertising in UK actually goes to the US because what the advertisers spend in UK is mostly finishing on Google Ads, on Google, on Microsoft, on Yahoo, on YouTube, and so on. So that money actually finishes in US. And since the users, especially young ones, are moving to the digital platforms, I'm quite concerned you know, that most of that money and time and also the influence will actually move to the areas where we won't have, at least Slovenia won't have any strength to negotiate any sort of deals. And you know that YouTube has started to advertise in Slovenia. Uh, they are now starting to launch paid uh, platforms within themselves and so on, uh, which actually means that they will decide who and what you will be able to see and under what conditions. And national regulation will be very weak in that regard. OK, thank you. Any more comments from you? Last comments? Yes? No. I suggest to conclude. It's nine o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Des, for coming from London. Thank you, Helena. And let's hope to meet again here or in London okay. or in Brussels. <laughs> Thank you all. In Brussels, bye -bye. only in the right circumstances. Yeah.